Galatians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 13, and as we always do, we're going to read through our entire passage to get the full context of what the writer, the Apostle Paul, is giving us here. So, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's our verse. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So for the last two weeks, we talked about goodness. But when we were talking about it, we didn't necessarily use that word. We related it to another word. What was our word that we used? Integrity. We talked about having integrity over the last couple of weeks, and we said our definition of integrity is the choice, it's because we have to make that conscious choice, the choice of God-honoring living in a non-God-honoring world. And it's not difficult to walk right outside of these doors and find that what we're talking about of that non-God-honoring world, is it? It's very easy to find that. So we've got to make a choice as followers of Jesus to live in a way that it honors God. And we said there's eight benefits, or we found at least in our passage, eight benefits of living with integrity. Direction, protection against haters, protection against enemies, protection against insecurity, provision, promises, peace, and that it's pleasing to God. That is definitely a benefit of living with integrity. So back to our key verse, it's verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and what's our next one? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. That's what we're going to talk about here uh, over the next two weeks. Um, Back in 2008, maybe some of you guys have heard this story before. I heard this a few years ago and then was recently reminded of this story. It's a great story. In 2008, Hurricane Ike ravaged Texas. Now, when Hurricane Ike hit Texas, it was a Category 2 storm, which we, you know, in South Florida, we kind of look at that and go, eh, eh, maybe I'll put the shutters out for that one. You know, who knows? If it's like Category 3, maybe we start to really pay attention. At least that's me. I was born and raised down here. Um, But we know some storms... Just because the wind isn't as high as other storms, there could be other effects. There could be flooding. There could be, a, a, you know, the, the, the seas can rise, maybe the, you know, a lot of rain. There, there could be a lot of other effects, and that's actually what happened in Texas. There was a, a little town, and it was kind of a, a retirement town. It was called Gilchrist, Texas. And there was maybe a couple of hundred homes in this tiny little community. And Hurricane Ike demolished that town. Take a look at this first picture here. 
That's Gilchrist, Texas. There's not a whole lot left, is there? They were not ready for the storm. But here's the thing, church. Look at this next picture. It's the exact same area. One house was left standing. Why do you suppose that is? How is it that one house could be left standing in the middle of all of that destruction? Here's what happened. The owners of this house had been in a storm before. And long before Hurricane Ike came, they called in an architect and they called in the construction company. And they said, we want to fortify this house in a way that no storm will take it out. We want to make it to where it doesn't matter, this house must stand. And it wasn't easy. It took a lot of money. I'm sure it took quite a bit of time. But let me ask you this. Do you think it was worth it? Do you think what they did worked and was it worth it? It was absolutely worth it, wasn't it? One of my favorite passages is Matthew chapter 7. I think we even read verse 24 last week. And you guys know I have this verse, this uh, inscription in my slab downstairs of my house. But Matthew 7, starting in verse 24, it says, Therefore, now, now, the reason why Jesus says that, this is Jesus speaking, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had just given the greatest sermon ever, and in a way, he had somewhat rewritten the law. Now, nothing actually changed except their perception of how they saw the law. All of those rules and everything, Jesus comes in and it looks like he flips everything upside down and he's like, no, 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 this is the original intention of this. And they're amazed at Jesus' teaching and he says all of these things and then verse 24 says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But then he gives the flip side to what happens if you don't do that. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The man that was faithful that Jesus was talking about in this, in this story, he was prepared for the storm. He knew a storm would come someday. He wasn't living in la-la land where, well, I'm the exception. I'm not going to have any storms come my way. I don't need all of this instruction, Jesus. No, no, no. He knew there would be a storm, and he got his house ready. And Because he did that, his house, his life did not fall. So I'm going to talk to you guys about faithfulness faithfulness. And in fact, my title for today is Remaining Faithful to the End. Church, we need to to build our lives in a way that no matter what storm comes our way, no matter what junk hits us, we need to be able to be faithful to the end. So as I normally do, as I'm studying, I looked up the definition of faithfulness. Once again, it was not helping. It was more like uh, the quality or the act of being faithful, not helpful. So we wrote our own definition here. So faithfulness is unswerving loyalty, devotion, or obedience. Now those are, 
We, we, we don't really like those three words necessarily, but we really don't like that third one, do we? <clears throat> we want to do our own thing. But this is unswerving loyalty, devotion, or obedience, regardless of circumstances or consequences. That's what faithfulness is. That's what being truly faithful to God is. God, I, I, you have my loyalty. You have my devotion. I am going to be obedient to you no matter what. That is the faithfulness that God is calling us to have. Now, I don't live in la-la land, as we just said. So here's a question. Is remaining faithful easy? No. It's not easy at, at all. It's, in fact, it's quite difficult, isn't it? So that's why I want to talk to us about remaining faithful to the end. Because I want all of our houses, when the storm comes, not if, but when the storm comes, I want all of our houses to be standing strong. I want all of our houses to be that one house that is left. I want more houses, but if there is going to be one house, I want it to be mine and I want it to be yours. So this morning, we're going to look at three of our seven facts or observations about faithfulness. And to do that, again, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 6. Now, as you're turning there, I want to give you a little warning. And we, we talked about this not too long ago, that there's this thing that happens in, in kids' church or Sunday school for kids a lot. When you say, like, Daniel in the lion's den, there's like, we know this story. We can tell you this story ourselves. And I say, okay, then get up here and do it yourself then, right? So it's like, and we laugh at kids doing that, but here's the thing. We as adults do that sometimes. When I tell you Daniel chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den, we all go, I have read that story a million times. I know exactly how it ends. Now, if you don't know the story of Daniel and the lion's den, I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag. He doesn't die, okay? He gets out. It works out all in the end. But see, we tend to think, I know everything that there is to know about this story. Like, I, there's nothing new for me to learn. But here's a really interesting thing. And I, I kind of do this church and pastor and Bible thing for a living, although it's a calling, it's not a living, but you know what I'm saying. Even I am amazed, and I don't know why I'm amazed because I know it, but I will often read scripture and read stories like this. And almost every time I read stories like this, God will bring something new to me. And it's like, I have never seen that before. And I've read this story and heard this story a thousand times. And see, that's why it says God's word is alive, it's living, it's active. It, 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 like, it, it does something in us. Now, God's word never changes and it never contradicts itself. But will we see different things when we explore God's word and read a story over and over and over? Will God maybe bring something out that is more pertinent to what we're going through in life? Absolutely. That's what God does with his word, and it's absolutely incredible. So, Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 1, we're going to look at three of our seven facts about faithfulness. We'll come back next week, and I've got some really cool kind of insight stuff that I just, I didn't want to shorten this week, so we'll talk about that next week. So, Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Now, I'll have to stop here and kind of explain what's going on. It says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. Now, pause right there for a second. Here's what's going on. Israel was exiled. They were taken out of Israel and out of Jerusalem. They were taken to Babylon 
Daniel, our main character here, along with, remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those guys, they were taken from Israel to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Whole bunch of stuff happened there. Then there was Nebuchadnezzar. Then there was Belshazzar. And then there was some other kings. The Babylonians got conquered. And now the Medes and the Persians are ruling. So Darius is actually the king now of what was Babylon. Now it's the the Medes and the Persians. And so Daniel, all the way through this, he was very, very faithful in a way that just, it's so funny, this story in a lot of ways mirrors the story of Joseph. And so he was so faithful in every single way, and that's what we're going to talk about, that he kind of worked his way up. So now we see King Darius, he's appointing three guys to rule over 120 of these rulers to rule over the entire land. Okay, everybody's kind of caught up to speed about what's going on? All right, here we go. It says, the satraps were made accountable to them. That's the three guys, Daniel being one of them. So that the king, and this is such an interesting line. We'll come back to this next week. So that the king might not suffer loss. I want to go off on that, but we're not going to right now. There's too much to dig into. Verse 3. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his, what? What's those next two words? His exceptional qualities. Um, Here, I'll finish reading and then we'll get back. That the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, what exceptional qualities do you think that Daniel had that got him this far? That the king saw him and was like, wow, like I kind of adopted this guy from, you know, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and some other kings and he kind of worked his way up. Like, he has some exceptional qualities. What do you think it was? Do you think it was because of his good looks? Probably not. And by the way, we always kind of picture Daniel in the lion's den as this young guy. He wouldn't have been young. He would have probably been maybe 70 years old, something like that by about now. So it probably wasn't his good looks, okay? Not to say he can't be good looking at 70 years old, okay? I'm rapidly approaching it. You're like, shut up. (laughs) It wasn't his good looks. Um, It probably wasn't because of any physical thing or what. What do you think it was that was his exceptional qualities that propelled him? His integrity. His faithfulness. Now, let's dig into that a little deeper because it's easy to say because he was faithful to God, that's why Darius saw him. No. It wasn't because he was faithful to God. Now, because he was faithful to God, he had integrity. But I think these exceptional qualities is because he was faithful to his position. I think he was very faithful in the position that he was in, which was a secular position, serving the king. And that's what King Darius saw and and took notice of and said, whoa, this guy shouldn't just be one of the three. This guy should be like my right-hand man. This guy should be like number two in the whole land. And Darius saw that. So this leads us to our first factor, our first observation about faithfulness. Faithfulness results in blessing. Now, I want to be very, very clear. This is not a prosperity gospel preaching church. Okay, I'm not saying come to Jesus and all your problems go away. In fact, I will preach almost the exact opposite. Will Jesus walk with you through the storm? Absolutely But no, all your problems don't go away. And I'm not saying every time that you display faithfulness, you will receive a blessing. There is not a one-to-one correlation. However, when God looks at us and says, that's my faithful servant, somehow, some way, I do believe there is blessing in that and that it honors God. So faithfulness results in. In blessing. Verse 4. At this, that was Daniel being promoted, the king saying, I'm going to put Daniel ahead of everybody. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. 
but they were unable to do so. Why? Because he was faithful to the king. He was faithful in his position. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Number two, second observation or fact about faithfulness. Faithfulness results in persecution or opposition. Now, this is the only negative one in my list. And again, there's not always a one-to-one correlation. Every time that you're faithful, there's going to be opposition. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that there are people out there who see your integrity, who see your faithfulness, who see how hard you try at your job. Not because you want to beat everybody else, but because that's what you are supposed to do. And what, what starts to rise up in those haters? Jealousy. And, and they, they, start to be, they start to resent you because of what you're doing. They're like, just a goody two-shoes. You ever been called that before? It's a compliment, by the way. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Here's Jesus. This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. This is in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are you when, not if, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward here on earth. No. No. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, if you are doing your job as a follower of Jesus, again, we talk about this all the time, not annoying Christian, but if you are really following Jesus, you're living a life with integrity, you're doing what you can in your job, you're being salt and light, you're having the the right God conversations when you can, people will see that and you will tick some people off at times. Not everybody's going to like that. Do you know why? Because darkness hates it when you shine a light on it. Darkness hates the light. So sometimes, not every time, but sometimes, we're going to see opposition when we are being faithful. You know what that can often tell you? You're doing it right. When, when people are rising up and talking against you because of your faith, you're probably doing something right, and that should be in some ways expected. So verse 5, Daniel chapter 6 says, finally, these men said, these are the jealous guys, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. What an awesome claim. Like, wouldn't that be amazing if people could say that about you and say that about me? Like, like there's never going to, like, like, I just... I, Maybe they do, but I don't ever see them. Do, like every single moment, it just looks like they're reflecting God in their lives. Now, again, none of us are perfect, but what an awesome thing to have said about you. Verse six. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. Here they are. They're, they're kind of puffing him up. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, Advisors and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, really important thing to understand in the story because we want to say, Darius, just change it. When it says, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, that cannot be altered or repealed or changed, this was absolute. 
The laws could not change. If, if there was a law and someone broke it, it had to be followed. There was no, ah, oh, we're going to make an exception this time. He would have basically been thrown out of power. It would not have gone well. So this is an absolute law. So verse 9 says, so King Darius put the decree in writing. Verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room and he cried and he complained and he hid himself, right? Is that what it says? That's basically the opposite of what it says. It says, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. And the next line is probably the best line in this entire story. Just as he had done before. This is something that Daniel had previously done days before, weeks before, months before, and years before. This was his routine. Daniel didn't just decide to fortify his house right before the storm came. Daniel didn't say, oh my goodness, this is bad. There's a law now. I better go pray to God that they don't see me praying. That's not what Daniel did. Daniel had the faithfulness of a champion. And he continued to do what he had always done. He was fortifying his house for a storm. Now, just like the couple in the story from Gilchrist, Texas, do you think that they heard Hurricane Ike was coming and they went to the hardware store and bought three rolls of duct tape and taped up their windows? I would think they did a little bit more than that, right? And church, the same goes for us. We've got to fortify our lives with, with a little bit more than just some duct tape. But see, that's kind of the faithfulness that we think that we can live sometimes. Duct tape faithfulness. I just made that up. You can write that down. <laughs> Duct tape faithfulness. It's going to be a thing now. It's going to catch on. It's going viral, I'm telling you. <laughs> Duct tape faithfulness. We're going to say it and people are like, what on earth are you talking about? Just say, don't worry. It made sense at the time. Number three, our third observation or fact about Faithfulness. Faithfulness breeds confidence. Daniel is basically the epitome of confidence. Notice that the story does not one time mention about how Daniel was worried, about how Daniel didn't agree with this new law, about how Daniel didn't go to King Darius and say, Darius, you don't understand. I can't follow this doesn't mention one thing about that, and I don't think it was, I don't even think it happened. Why? Because Daniel was confident that God would take care of him, that his faithfulness to God mattered more than anything else. And with that confidence, he would weather the storm. Verse 11 said, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands... And here's that thing, in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. That is some incredible faithfulness. 
that Daniel was showing. That's confidence that, hey, God, no matter what, you are the most important thing. Not some trouble that I might get in, not some lions, not my life. You, God, are the most important thing. By the way, this story, we call it Daniel in the lion's den. Who do you think is the main character in this story? Is it the lions? I mean, they're in the title, so it could be them. Is it lions? No. Is it Daniel? I mean, it's Daniel in the lion's den. Is Daniel the main character in this story? Nope. God. God is the main character. This, this story ought to be called How God Delivered Daniel in the Lion's Den. It's a little long, but this story and this story is all about God. It's all about a God that we are called to be absolutely faithful to. So three facts about faithfulness. Number one, faithfulness results in blessing. Number two, faithfulness results in persecution or opposition. And number three, faithfulness breeds confidence. So we're going to pause there for today, but I want to leave you with something because I don't want to leave you hanging too much. I want to ask a question and then I'll answer it. I, I think we've kind of answered it today already, but here's the question. If it's so much work to be faithful, like we talked about earlier, why should we be faithful to God? Because it's a lot of work. It's not easy. It, we do see persecution. It cuts out on a lot of activities or hobbies or things that mm, we probably shouldn't be doing anyway. Why should we be faithful to God? Well, there's a lot of verses that talk about it. Here's one of them. It's in 1 Samuel Chapter 12, verse 24. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you'd like. It says this. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with, how much? All your heart. That is complete faithfulness. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. And here's the reason why. Here's why we should be faithful to God. Consider, I love that he said this, consider what great things he has done for you. Why should we be faithful to God? Because he is so faithful to us. Now, I love this verse. It's a great verse. But see, this verse only tells half of the story. Because the writer says, consider what great things he has done. What tense is that verb? It's past tense. This verse doesn't even talk. And I'm not saying this verse is incomplete or anything is wrong with it. But this verse doesn't even talk about the future tense, does it? See, it's good enough to look back and see what God has done in our lives to be faithful. That would be enough. What God has already done, God, you deserve my full devotion. I will be faithful to you. It would be enough. But there's so much more to come, isn't there? There is an eternity and a promise that we have through God's Son, Jesus, who chose to come to this earth, who chose to to give his life. They did not take his life from him. He gave his life and chose to hang on a cross, taking all of our sin and all of our shame. That's a really, really great reason to be faithful to God. Amen? That is the best reason because you and I, I hate to be so blunt, are dirty, wretched, filthy, black-hearted sinners in need of a Savior. And guess what? He paved the way for us. 
that's a good reason to be faithful to him. Why? Because God is, not was, is faithful to us. Let's pray. God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, thank you that so many times every single one of us can look back in life and just see where we have messed up royally. God, we have literally turned our backs on you. But you are still faithful to us. God, I love how your word says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we got our junk together. Not when we cleaned up our act. Not when we decided to stop doing bad things. While we were still sinners, you died for us. That's good news, God. That's the best news. That is the gospel. Thank you, God, for giving the most important thing that you have, your son, Jesus, to die for us. So gracious of you, God. Great is thy faithfulness, as your word says. God, I lift up those this morning who do not know that faithfulness that you offer us that do not know that grace and that forgiveness and that do not have a relationship with you. God, right now in this moment, if there are some here that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior who have not given their lives to you, decided to make you number one in their life, Right now, Lord, in this moment, speak to their hearts. God, impress on their hearts that they need you. That we are all just dirty, wretched sinners in need of a Savior. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. So right now, God, if people don't have a relationship with you, would they just say, God, I need you? God, I trust you. God, I trust in your son, Jesus, that he took my sin and made a way for me to spend eternity with you. God, save me. God, change me. God, I give you my life. Be my savior. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not gonna call you out or make any commotion, but if you would just slip your hand up and just say, I prayed that today for the first time. I got it right. I gave my life to Jesus. I wanna start a relationship with Jesus today. Would you just slip your hand up? Jesus, thank you that you are so good. Thank you that you love us. And again, thank you that you are so, so faithful to us. God, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. God, we lift up this time of offering. God, would you help us to be generous and help us to use this to further your kingdom in ways like never before. And it is in your awesome name, the holy, precious, and powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.